Okay, class, welcome back. In this part of the lecture, we'll get into some acute care uh, clinical reasoning, basically some of the stuff that you'll do uh, throughout your day as an acute care uh, physical therapist. So the first thing that you'll probably do um, every single day working with, uh, you know, within this setting is your systems review and your medical screening, right? This is, again, no different in terms of the, the, the name of the process um, from any setting. It's going to look a little bit different in the acute care setting because you're going to have access to different information and different communication points, right? So um, you'll be going through a chart review for every patient, looking at any acute changes overnight, any trends in labs or vitals that were taken, again, because these patients, right, they're in a hospital for a reason, right? Their acute medical status um, can be a little bit in flux. So you always want to make sure, um, you know, if this patient's stable, what they looked like yesterday may look completely different than it is today and maybe even throughout well, within a day, right? What someone looked like in the morning may be a little bit different than what they look like in the afternoon. You're going to discuss the, you know, the patient's current status with the nurse. And I, I can't stress the importance of this anymore, right? It, it's... Um, it's crucial to have good communication. The nurses in particular are there 24-7, right? Unlike most countries, PTs typically aren't there all day. Um, nurses are with, are with that patient every day um, and, or, or all day or for most of the day. Uh, and it's always important to make sure you communicate with the nurse, just, hey, the patient's status you know, kind of clear what maybe, you know, or maybe not clear, but communicate what you plan on doing with the patient, um, what the patient maybe has scheduled for that day, because maybe the patient's going to go down to a lab or go down to get imaging or have a procedure done, timing your treatment um, around the patient's schedule. Because again, you know, th th there's multiple different providers that want to see that patient, right? So we got to make sure we have a coordinated schedule uh, that also keeps, you know, the patient safe, too. Um, always want to review, are there any precautions, right? Are there sternal precautions? Again, we talked about them, maybe different in each facility, um, but there are, each institution probably has some form of uh, sternal precautions. Maybe they have hip precautions, right? Maybe they've got some other, uh, you know, precautions for some other type of procedure. Hemodynamic precautions, like post-stroke, maybe they have a certain blood pressure they don't want them going to, or they don't want their head positioned in a head down position, right? So just making sure you communicate, understand the precautions so we can effectively provide safe, safe rehabilitation uh, services to this patient. And then of course, the patient's disposition, like what's their, what's their current status or what's the 411? All right. I also wanna stress the power of observation, right? So. Um, just like in the outpatient setting, so much of what we do can just be ascertained just from looking in the room, right? Just looking at the patient before we even start, you know, our subjective examination. Importantly, where is the patient located, right? Are they, you know, are they in the bed? Are they seated in a chair, right? Are they awake, right? What's their level of consciousness? Is their family present, right? Communicating with the family can be, is, is crucially important. Um, has nursing initiated mobilization already, right? Is this patient, you know, already so safe to ambulate, they're, they're doing it with nursing staff. Is there appropriate equipment in the room? Like, what do I need to go get um, before I start working with this patient, right? Maybe this patient, you know, has uh, an amputa amputation. It's the first time they're getting up. I might need a walker, right? Maybe I'm going to need, you know, a, a suction device to attach because they have a you know, a chest tube or a wound vac that I might need to keep on suction throughout the course of uh, treatment. And that's something I could have ascertained even before coming into the room by talking to the nurse, talking to other members of the staff, reviewing what was in the chart. So the power of observation uh, is crucial. Again, this is just an image of what a hospital room will look like, um, typically in a floor unit. Uh, there's a great video, again, by Dr. Bento covering uh, you know, the, the, what you need to look at in, in the, you know, in the hospital room before even starting and where things are typically located. Every facility is a little bit different. So just get more, get, get familiar with where things are just so you know where, where to get it if you need to. Um, all right. And then the power of observation again, like looking at monitors. So, uh, and we, again, we cover this a little bit, um, in that video, that the skills video, but this is a typical hospital monitor, right? So you'll have the ECG, running, 
Um, you'll have your pulse oximetry running. You'll have your blood pressure, if they have an A-line especially, looking at arterial blood pressure, which is direct pressure. Um, you'll get respiratory rate um, and a bunch of other things as well, temperature, different things like that, mean arterial pressure measurements. So again, it's you know, this is something you can look at even before starting working with the patient. Is this determining, is this patient stable? Right, because if the patient's not stable, if they're throwing a ton of PVCs or their blood pressure's bottomed out or if it's super critical, maybe we don't want to work with that patient right now or maybe we need to call you know, the nurse or someone else. Um, often these, these monitors will also have alarms too, which we can you know, silence if we need to by pressing um, you know, the yellow button, but always just be aware of you know, what's, what's appropriate to be silenced or not and being able to communicate um, effectively with the nurse in case something uh, changes. Uh, looking at what's connected to them. Okay, we're gonna cover labs um, and, li or and lines in another lecture, but like what, do they, do they have lines connected? They have an IV line, do they have an A line connected? Are they, do they have restraints, right? Um, are they on supplemental oxygen? And what's the delivery type system? Is it just a nasal cannula? Or are they on a full mask, a venturi mask, a non-rebreather mask? That can give you an indication of what your you know, the oxygen needs that patient's going to need and how they may actually tolerate, um, you know, getting up and moving, right? If someone's on high flow oxygen um, or on a non-rebreather at rest and they're, you know, you know, getting up and, up and moving, which is going to tax the, their ventilatory system a little bit more, right? Maybe we need to be, we need to plan for that, right? Think of, again, that physiology that we've learned and tie it to this acute pathophysiology and patient management. Surgical instrumentation, right? Are, do they have an OR, ORAF, right? Are they uh, hooked up to a vent? Like if they're in an ICU setting, like again, just seeing what's in there, knowing and being prepared and anticipating what I'm going to need to do um, in order to keep this patient safe while I'm working with them. And then how much time it may, it may take to set up the room, right? Typically, you want to plan to set up your treatment to go to, the side with, to go towards the side with the most critical lines. That would be your arterial line and stuff like that, or the sides um, with just the most total lines, right? Because you typically don't want to move away from them because you're going to put tension on them, which could cause them to be dislodged, which is a big, big, big problem. Um, it can be a big, big uh, safety concern. So um, the other thing is, again, just like, being able to discern um, changes in the monitors as well, what is artifact. Sometimes when the patient's moving, these, these signals will get a little bit wonky. Um, and you'll have to determine whether or not, you know, this is actually a valid signal. So typically, you know, for example, post oximetry, right, we should see that normal kind of sinusoidal wave pattern, right? If they're, you know, say their post ox drops to like 80 during a transfer, but the wave is all kinds of weird looking or not even really present, it's like flat almost, that's artifact. Or as well as being able to determine if something got dislodged, right? Or if a, if a monitor came off, like an ECG lead, which, which happens frequently. And again, you'll often get a, a, an alarm saying, hey, ECG lead connected and having to find it. Um, and always, again, making sure we're taking vitals throughout each step. Probably the biggest thing for line management, right? We talked about making sure that we set stuff up, um, you know, work towards the side of the most critical lines or the most lines, but understand everything that's connected to the patient. And if you don't know, ask. Don't just, don't go in cavalierly disconnecting things um, or moving things around. And like, again, it, it's, it's the patients are in a hospital for a reason, right? If you don't know, ask. Don't, don't, don't assume, ask. Ask what's safe to be connected. Um, some stuff may be safe to be disconnected. Like if you have a, an IV, you know, line that is, you know, just saline, that can probably just dis be disconnected during the course of care. But you got to ask the nurse, um, you know, hey, you know, could, could we could we plug this temporarily so it may be a little bit easier to work with this patient. Um, along those lines too, no pun intended, you might need to know, you know, might need to figure out how much assistance you might need to manage multiple lines, right? If they've got, you know, six, seven, eight lines, maybe you need another person um, to help, you know, help you manage those lines while you're working with that patient. Maybe it's an OT, maybe it's a PT aid, maybe it's one of the nurses there if they have time, or if it's a, not a super critical line, maybe a family member. Um, 
which could be a you know a good education piece for them, just you know to help you know encourage them to ambulate and work with the patient throughout the course of the day. So again, I really like this kind of golden rule, you know, which is you know the, I think the golden rules for living. Um, again, like if you if you if you make a mess, clean it up. If you move it, put it back. Um, you know, and if it belongs to someone else, or if you don't know how to operate, like leave it alone. Get permission to use it. Right? It's like communicate and anticipate your needs to keep the patient safe. Next, we'll get into sub the subjective interview, right? So this will be no different really than what you kind of do for the outpatient side. We're gonna assess mentation, orientation, alertness. We're gonna, at, you know, probably the, probably the biggest point of emphasis for uh, the subjective interview in the acute care setting is determining the prior level of function, like what the patient was able to do prior to coming into the hospital, which kind of helps predict, or at least gives you a, a, a benchmark that the patient may be able to get back to upon discharge, um, or what you know what's what's a reasonable goal for them. Things we want to ask, right? Does a patient live alone, right? Do they have family nearby? How many floors are in their house? How many steps to their needs? Not just steps in their house. How many steps do they have to get to the bathroom, the, the kitchen, stuff like that? Because um, it may be a little bit different, right? They may only have four steps to get in the house, but their bathroom's on the second floor, right? Um, and there's no bathroom on the first floor. So it's not just four steps to get into the house. They have to, you know, ascend and descend. They may have to ascend and descend 18 steps, right? Four and then whatever 14 they have to climb to get to the second floor, right? It's a big bit of a difference, right? Um, also ask, can they establish themselves on the first floor, right? Probably not as common depending on what area you're at. We're in Chicago. Most of our houses are multi-level homes. When I, when, I lived in, when I lived in Florida, most of our patients were in ranch houses. So everything was on the first floor. So being able to ask again, like just what's, what's the layout? What's the setup at home? And then uh, asking family as well, too, if they're present can be a huge, huge uh, uh, help to that. So our objective examination, right? So again, not much different than what you might see from, you know, again, from a reasoning standpoint in uh, acute care versus outpatient, right? We're going to be test, we're going to be formulating hypotheses for what may be impaired for this patient, and then we're going to test it. Probably the bigger difference, we're going to be screening vitals throughout the entire process. Again, there's a reason why these patients are in the hospital. we got to make sure, if, you know, uh, if a patient can, you know, physiologically tolerate um, the interventions and assessments we're, we're providing, right? So taking vitals at baseline um, and throughout. We're going to do a quick, you know, screen for a few different things. Skin and integumentary system. Maybe they've got an incision that we want to make sure isn't, you know, draining too much or red and inflamed or infected, um, basic screens for active range of motion, sensation, vision, strength, which could often just be MMT, or you can determine it from functional strength. Can they get in and out of bed? We'll get into a mobility assessment, right? So can they roll in bed? Can they get up to, you know, supine to sit? Can they transfer from sit to stand? What's their balance look like? Um, we'll often do pre-gate assessments, right? So the egress test, which we'll cover, which is a great way to kind of conceptualize or uh, combine a few different tests together um, to assess whether a patient's safe to start leaving uh, the room or ambulating even within the room. Um, gate, right? We're going to do gate assessments, stair assessments, right? So again, our, our big goal is to determine is this patient can go home you know, safe or not, and what needs they will what needs they will require in order for them to do that eventually. Um, I also want to stress too the value of using standardized outcome measures even in the um, acute care setting. Right. So uh, again, you may see you may we're working through changing things as a, as a area of practice, but you know the six minute walk test, DGI, five minute gait speed. These can all provide quantitative, objective benchmarks for the patient versus just saying the patient ambulated 100 feet, look good. That doesn't really tell you as much, right? Um, or gait speed, normal. Well, what was their gait speed, right? So we can, we can you know, do a little, right, with these tests, which don't require a lot of instrumentation that we're kind of already sort of doing, right, um, by what we typically do with a patient, 
but we're providing some hard, hard numbers to track progress, which gives us a better place at the table when we're communicating with our you know, interdisciplinary team about the patient and you know, how, how our services um, are involved here. All right, so again, add, add, some, add, some, um, add some numbers behind our assessments for these patients. And then of course, always keeping an eye on hemodynamics while the patient performed tasks. Like orthostatic intolerance is frequently come encountered in acute care. Um, could be for a lot of different reasons. Could be from the medications, just the acute uh, change in status, maybe a little bit of the blood loss, maybe a little bit of barrel reflex uh, changes and stuff like that. Just be mindful of that. Vitals are vital in every setting and especially in acute care. So next we'll cover the egress test. The egress test is actually a great way to determine if a patient, um, it's a quick screen to determine if a patient is appropriate to start ambulation uh, within the room. It's not like a, you know, determine if a patient's independent, but it gives us a pretty good benchmark. So it has three stages basically that you have the patient uh, go through, um, which is, which kind of works well because these are things you typically do in a hospital setting um, anyway, it's just a nice way again to add some objectivity to what we are doing in the acute care setting. The patient starts sitting on the edge of the bed, feet flat on the ground, um, with on their no slip socks or, or non-skids, um, hips slightly above knees, therapist on the side, gait belt on. The first level of test, your patient, you're going to have the patient perform three repetitions of sit to stand transfers. The patients can use their hands to push off the bed, which is fine. Um, this would be a great time to maybe look at their hemodynamics as they respond to the sit to stand. If they clear that, we move on to the uh, the next uh, phase. But within these sit to stands, there's three different maneuvers they're going to perform. So the first one is we're just clearing the buttocks, right? So they're just going to lift, you know, push off, just get an inch off, right? So okay, if they clear that, we move on to the second stand, right? They'll stand all the way up. Okay, if they can do that, all right, we're going to sit them back down. And then the third one, they'll stand all the way up and remain in standing. Might be a great opportunity as well. Grab a quick blood pressure, see how they do. Um, and then move on to the second part of the test, which is our pre gate assessment. All right, so um, the patient then takes three steps in place, right? So just unweighting, assessing toe clearance, a little bit of dynamic balance, which you need for ambulation. And then the patient takes three steps forward with each foot, right? So they must advance, so the heel is forward of the stance foot um, and shouldn't see any, you know, a large shift in their, you know, um, in their body, shouldn't be a lot of imbalance or buckling in that stance leg. And again, just gives us a, an, an idea of how well um, and how appropriate they may be for ambulation. Again, this is not to say a patient's independent with ambulation, but gives us a pretty good benchmark to say, hey, this patient's maybe a, appropriate to start egressing, which is just means to move away uh, from the bed to perform, you know, then your gait assessment. So I often do this with, with uh, a walker in front of the patient. So if they, for any reason, like kind of need to, you know, grip that, that's fine. Okay, just another la layer of safety. And the, the benefit of doing this test and the way it's set up is they're right in front of the bed. So if they ever have to sit back down because maybe their blood pressure bottoms out or their higher heart rate skyrockets, where they have any sort of issue, we can get them right back into bed, right? So it's a great way to again to be systematic um, and objective, um, while also keeping the patient safe and giving you good um, data or high value data uh, to work with your patient, right? And determine their, their their functional status. And with that, we'll end our uh, objective and examination part, and then the last. Part of this lecture, we'll get into treatment considerations, assessment, and discharge planning.